All right, everybody, here we go. Here we go. It is time once again. Um, week something of COVID life. Crown times. Um, I hope everybody's okay. I hope everybody's well. I hope everybody is... Um, uh, safely shut in um, and or outside enjoying the beautiful weather in socially distant ways. I took a walk yesterday with a human being who is neither my spouse nor my kid. That was the first um, social activity I've had in a hot second and um, I walked as far the fuck away from the dude as I could while still like being able to shout a conversation at him and him at me. So, um, trying to do my part, man, trying to do my, my social distancing. I got my little travel hand sanitizer right here. I got my little, Uh, I'm about to um, rob your convenience store and then not sneeze on you mask. So trying to be careful. I hope you all are being careful. I hope everybody's feeling okay and is um, aguantando y superando. I don't know how to say that in English, but you know what I'm saying, right? I hope everybody's getting through this and... and um, I, here's what I hope for you. I hope that you can squint in just the right way to see the light at the end of the tunnel because it is a long, dark tunnel. But there will be a light at the other side. Okay. So um, last week in the live um, stream, merrily down the live stream, you know what I mean? Um, last week in the live stream, I spoke to folks and uh, I said, should we stick with the regular agenda, the regular syllabus, or should we go with some um, coronavirus related content for the last two weeks of the course? And they said, let's go with some coronavirus related content. So that's what we're doing. So for this week, I've asked you to read a chapter that has um, that is not about coronavirus at all. A chapter that is about something that happened 102 years before coronavirus is a chapter about the Spanish flu of 1918 and its effect on the industrial cities of the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts. And there's a lot of reasons why I went there with this. And this is going to be a lecture that's going to work at kind of different levels. And there's going to be some overlapping and some messiness, but um, it's going to be important for us to pay close attention, to take some notes, and to try to work out the way that all of these things fit together because they do fit together. So the, the reason why I started thinking about this was because the very first video uh, that I did um, for the week after your two week long spring break was a continuation of our conversation about sprawl. And we had started that conversation about sprawl before spring break, um, and but we had never got a chance to finish it. And most of us live in the suburbs. Um, and most of us, that's what we know, and we appreciate um, living in the suburbs. We appreciate our lives, and we feel defensive when our lives are... Um, uh, our lifestyles are called into question. And I was in my lecture, and, and because this is the way I think, 
I was critical of sprawl. Now, I was careful to acknowledge that there are many advantages to sprawl. You get more bang for your buck in the sprawl. You get a bigger house for the same amount of money. You get uh, good schools. You get at least um, uh, the illusion of safety, if not the reality of safety and security. You get uh, peace of mind and tranquility and all these things. They're the reasons that people for 150 years have been moving out of the city and into the sprawl. But I was also very clear that I think the sprawl is bad for us in terms of social capital in terms of our resiliency as a as as a community i think the sprawl is bad for us in terms of um uh its environmental impact i think the sprawl is bad for us in terms of its uh macroeconomic impacts and i think the sprawl is bad for us in terms of uh creating and promoting segregation and social and racial injustice and so lots of folks said, yeah, Mike, I get that. That makes sense. Other folks said, well, you know, uh, I mean, there's a reason why we all live in the sprawl. It's convenient. It's pleasant. And I'm, I'm going to defend it, which is all good. Um, <clears throat> and then I started thinking about density, right? Because one of the things that I had been talking about on and on and on when we were talking about sprawl was uh, the, the advantages of density, right? I was talking about when we're all crowded in together in an apartment building in, a, in the center city, uh, you know, we're spending per capita way less, we're using per capita way fewer resources, fewer fossil fuels, uh, fewer municipal dollars, um, just many, many fewer resources, and that's good for everybody. And then I started reflecting on the character of a pandemic, particularly a respiratory pandemic or an airborne uh, pandemic, and we don't really know if COVID-19 is airborne. I've read that it isn't, and I've read that it may be. We know that it's transmitted by um, uh, phlegm and, and saliva. Um, we know that it sticks on surfaces for a long time. Um, it can be picked up very easily. And so, um, so in a, in a very real way, this density, population density, that I was singing the praises of a few weeks ago when I was talking about the environmental impacts of living in the city versus living in the suburbs. That same density that is good for the environment and good for the economy uh, and good for our social relationships and good for social justice, it's bad for pandemics. It makes them worse. If you look at, now, there are lots of other considerations. Some of, the city, some of the countries that have handled this the best, South Korea nailed this thing. And South Korea is a very population dense country. Um, Singapore is, you know, maybe the most population dense country in the world. And it's handled this thing masterfully. The United States is not population dense. We're a big, I mean, we have a ton of people, but we have a ton of space. And so um, we're not population dense. And we bungled this thing, uh, you know, on the order of um, some of the most inept and corrupt um, uh, states in the world. I mean, we bungled this thing. Um, so there isn't a direct correlation between how population dense your place is and how much coronavirus there is because of the mitigating factors of government response, uh, citizen sort of will in terms of following the rules uh, and the protocols about social distancing and, and self-quarantining and so on and so forth. However, if we take all of those factors out, there is a relationship between population density and sickness. So let's look at within the United States, where are the places um, where coronavirus is spreading 
uh, most rapidly? Where there are the most cases? Well, obviously New York City uh, is is number one. Chicago also has a lot. Uh, New Orleans, Louisiana has a lot. If we look at the places where it's spreading the most quickly, these are going to more often than not be population dense places. These are going to be population centers, aka metropolitan areas, aka cities. And if we look at the places where coronavirus is moving more slowly, um, those are going to be less population dense areas. Those are going to be rural places. Those are going to be suburbs to a certain extent. Now, you can get sick in the suburbs. The suburbs is not a panacea. The suburbs is not a magical pill that you take that makes you immune from COVID-19. You can get sick in the suburbs. But, um, and I, the, the reason why I, I arrived at this set of reflections is because I was feeling really fucking grateful that I have a decent sized house and a pretty small family because it's been beautiful out and I can go out into my backyard and I can kick a soccer ball and I can, um, you know, throw a Frisbee with my son and I can, you know, do an ollie on my skateboard and uh, I can, uh, you know, do all these things. I can work in the garden um, in my house. I mean, I can, you know, my kid can be in the basement. I can be on the first floor and my wife can be on the second floor or the, the second floor. We can, we all have our own floors, right? So I have a relatively uh, decent amount of space per person. And that's because I live not really in the sprawl. It's a historic area, but it's a residential subdivision or not a subdivision, but it's a residential neighborhood of single family houses of sort of middle, middle class, single family houses and so be, and I live in Bloomington normal and because I'm here and in that particular space um, I have a lot of advantages over people who might live in really amenity rich places you know in really uh, great hipster neighborhoods in Chicago um, where under normal circumstances they're living life because they're surrounded by you know um, three-star restaurants and uh, and great, you know, um, cultural amenities and all kinds of things and parks and the, you know, lake shore and all that stuff. But right now, they're stuck in a two-bedroom apartment. And I've got a backyard and a front yard. And so, so I was thinking to myself, you know, all this uh, essentially sprawl dissing that I do in class has come to bite me in the ass. And I, and I have to concede that under these particular circumstances, density is working against us in a major way. And so that is that set of reflections is just background for how I arrived at wanting you all to read this chapter that I assigned you called Influenza 1918. It's from the book the cover of which you've been staring at for the last 13 minutes. Um, uh, it's a, a memoir from the, or, or a social history of the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts from the late uh, 1990s, written by a um, Lebanese American woman um, named Jane Brox, who's a beautiful writer. And this is one chapter of a book and the book tells a much, much longer um, history, uh, a contextualized history. And so you're just reading this one little chapter totally out of its context. Um, but so, so I'm going to give you a little bit of that context here. Um, so let's let's start by moving on to the next slide. Let's see what the next slide has in store for us. I don't even know. I just put this together. And I don't remember what it is. So let's find out together. Bow. Oh, it's a map. Mappity map. So um, this book is the story of the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts during the 20th century. And so let me get out my color palette here. What do you want to go with? You want to go with, uh, how about, mm, let's go with light blue. Uh, it's, it's feeling kind of teal to me, but we're going to just do light blue. 
So this is Boston right here. Um, let me make this bigger if I can. Boston. Oh, that's yellow. All right. Well, that's cool. Yellow is cool. So the Merrimack River is this thing here, which you see has its headwaters up here in New Hampshire and then flows down through Concord, New Hampshire and Manchester, New Hampshire, and then flows into Massachusetts and hits flows through Lowell, Massachusetts and Lawrence, Massachusetts, and then out into the Atlantic Ocean and it's north of Boston, Massachusetts. So in the late 19th century, so the 1880s, 1890s, uh, we didn't have much in the way of um, vehicular transportation. We didn't have cars. We didn't have many streets. And so the highways of the late 19th century were waterways, right? We had barges, we had boats. And so the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts during the um, uh, industrial urban industrial revolution sort of period became an epicenter of textile manufacturing, okay? Um, it had been before that a very quiet rural agricultural area. It's a fertile uh, valley and there were lots of small farms throughout the 1800s, late 1800s into the early 1900s, this valley becomes transformed very quickly because of its location on the banks of this river that was big and went right out to the, um, to the Atlantic in such a way that um, ships could take materials that were produced along the banks of the Merrimack right out to the Atlantic and then across the Atlantic to Europe for sale. And so this area experienced very, very rapid economic development. And virtually overnight, it was transformed over the course of a few decades, but in the whole scheme of things, that's overnight. It was transformed from a very sleepy agricultural valley to a bustling um, urban manufacturing nucleus. This is a photograph that I took some years ago Awesome. I almost just uh, spilled coffee all over myself. I went in for like a really deep swallow. Woo! This photograph, this is, um, this is a factory on the banks of the Merrimack. This is in Manchester, New Hampshire. This is obviously not from the 18th century um, or the 19th century rather. I took this photograph and um, these, what had been factories from 1890 until about 1940 have been in the 2000s brought back as uh, condos, um, lofts, um, uh, business like office space for um, tech companies and that sort of thing. Um, but you get, you get the sense of how big these were. And this is a statue in Manchester, New Hampshire called the Mill Girl. And the next slide is going to have the plaque. If you look, let's, st let's stick with yellow. I like yellow. I'm feeling yellow right now. If you look at this plaque on the wall here, the next slide is going to be a um, close up of that. And so the plaque reads, the mill girl. She stands here for thousands of 19th century working women, industrial revolutionaries who broke with the past to earn their living, making history and creating the future. In 1880, one third of Manchester's population, 3,385 women, worked in the textile mills of the Amaskeag Manufacturing Company, situated below along the banks of the Merrimack River. And that 
that big red brick building that I showed you two slides ago, that is was the Amiskiag Manufacturing Company's main plant. Um, so, okay, so why, what, so what? The mill girl, pretty statue. What does this have to do with anything? What does this have to do with why uh, I, I have to wash my hands 70 times a day in 2020? Well, here it is. In the 1880s, when these factories were first being built, they were, um, they needed people to work in them. And the only people that lived in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts in the 1880s were farmers and their families. And um, so farm girls, you know, farm, farm women, well farm, let's start with farm men. Farm men, they're out on the farm farming. Farm women, they're in the house, they're cooking, they're doing domestic things. Farm boys, they're out on, in the fields apprenticing. Farm girls, they ain't doing shit. So when in the late 19th century, they start needing a lot of workers for these factories, they start hiring farm girls. And so the first wave of workers in these factories, uh, textile mills along the banks of the Merrimack River are young girls. But the way capitalism works is that it constantly needs cheaper workers because workers get better over time, right? Workers become more skilled, workers become um, more confident, workers become um, they get promoted, they spend more time there, they earn more money, and um, so capital needs to continue to replenish, at least capital when, it, when we're talking about uh, manufacturing like textile, light manufacturing like textiles, needs to constantly be replenishing a supply of cheap workers. So farm girls, after a while, they are well trained. They are um, be, they become higher skilled workers, and so they're worth more, and so they earn more pay, which is good for them, but it isn't good for the company. The company wants cheaper workers, so after a while, farm girls aren't working for them anymore. So they start advertising and recruiting from Europe. The very first wave of European immigrants come from Western Europe. They come from Germany. They come from Ireland. Um, the second wave, which is a much bigger wave, and the third wave, the second wave starts coming from um, Eastern Europe. And so they're Lithuanian and they're Polish um, and they are Czech. And then the third wave starts coming from Latin Europe and they're Spanish and they're Italians and they're Middle Eastern. And that's when Jane Brock's parents, who are Lebanese, come and settle in Lawrence, Massachusetts. So as the plants, factories grow, the numbers of people and the variety of people coming into the Merrimack Valley also grows. So what was in 1870, a sleepy, quiet, white, um, rural farming place is by 1910, so we're talking 40 years later, a very urbanized, very dirty, um, very densely populated um, center uh, of people from all around the world, all working in these factories. And working in these factories, as you might imagine, under some pretty inhumane conditions. OK, 
Okay, so we have a couple of competing stories here. We have the story of how capital is always trying to um, be is always trying to pay as little as possible to its workers, as little as it can possibly get away with to its workers, to, therefore to, uh, to maximize profits. And it does that by cheapening work. And when work refuses to be cheapened, as the farm girls then refuse to be cheapened, it, it looks to cheapen in other directions, right? And so now it's looking to Western Europe to cheapen, but eventually the Irish and the Germans aren't going to be um, cheap enough, like the farm girls weren't cheap enough. Now the Western Europeans aren't cheap enough, so now we go to Eastern Europe. Now the Eastern Europeans aren't cheap enough, so now we go to Latin Europe. Now the Latin Europeans aren't cheap enough, so then we go to um, the Middle East. Now the Middle Eastern folks aren't cheap enough, so now we look to um, Southeast Asia. And now Southeast Asian folks aren't cheap enough. So now we're going to bring people from Central America, right? And so it's this constant cycle of capital looking for the cheapest labor that it can find, which creates, um, and so that's an economic story. But that economic story has implications for other realms of life like public health. Okay, I promise this is going to come full here. Um, so, so the Merrimack Valley in the early 1900s was a place in which it was a very, very densely populated place. Like I said, it was a place where there was lots of work, but it was arduous, arduous work. It was poorly paid. Workers were not respected. They were not treated well. This was before the New Deal. This was before any of the sort of basic fundamental things that we think of as rights, as sort of standards in work uh, existed, right? So for example, if I say to you, uh, how many hours is full time? You'll say to me 30, I mean 40. Um, well, where does that come from? That had to be decided at some point. That what we weren't born, as I always say, in a state of nature, naked, uh, you know, on a mountaintop, being like, hmm, 40 hours is the natural um, um, best amount of hours per week that people should work. That was created at some point. Before that, uh, before it was created, that didn't exist. There were no standards, and so. In the early 20th century, in the Merrimack Valley, in these in these textile mills, people were working 80 hours a week. They were working 60 hours a week, and they felt so pushed that in 1912 they organized a strike. It was a very famous strike. Uh, you can look at you can look it up on the World Wide Internet. Search for the Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, this is a photo of that. And um, so that was that, that strike was a moment of great um, importance for the labor movement in the United States um, because it was a successful strike. So uh, managers had cut wages, and people were you know they were already living hand to mouth, and wages were cut, and so. Um, that you know made it even worse, e even more difficult to survive. And then, shortly thereafter, on, to on top of cutting wages, management um, cut hours. So now we're making less money, and we're also working fewer hours. And it got to a point where the workers literally couldn't, could not eke out a living on the amount of money they were making. And so they they were forced. Their hand was forced. They had no other choice. They struck. Bread and Roses strike. And it was successful. It was an important moment in labor history because it was successful. Um, and I mention this only to say that this is uh, uh, sort of an important historical moment. And it also speaks to, if you look at this photograph, you can tell it speaks to the character of this place during this time. It was a chaotic place. 
It was a place where people from all over the world were living in crowded tenement housing um, uh, with basic, basic conditions, um, being worked to the bone, living hand to mouth, m being miserably exploited. And uh, that, and so that set the stage. So this strike, this photo in the strike, 1912. Now remember, what year did Spanish flu hit? 1918. So this is only six years before Spanish flu that this strike happens. And this is a photograph of Lowell, Massachusetts on the Merrimack. I, I pointed out Lowell on the map a few slides back. And you can see here the, um, this is 1910. So you can see the river, you can see the textile mills along the banks of the river, you can see the smokestacks. And um, even though it is a black and white photograph, you you don't even really notice that, right? Because it just, you, you could just sort of picture it being covered in ash, covered in soot, and looking this gray, even if it weren't a black and white photograph. And so let me, with my little handy dandy highlighter here, um, indicate some buildings off to the left. These buildings here that I just circled, these are, um, this is worker housing. So workers were housed in tenements. It's basically um, very low quality housing um, right next to the plants so that they could walk right over to the plants. Um, and so you see that the plants are right on the banks and then the workers live just to the left of that. This is another uh, photograph. This is Manchester, New Hampshire. <clears throat> so this is the Amos Keog factory, some of its buildings. Uh, I don't have a date for this photograph, but let's assume that it's right around the same 19 early 1900s, first decade of the 1900s probably. And uh, this is a, a factory building here, but then in red, right behind it, I'm circling one of the worker dorms. Um, and so you, you, you can see here that the way the workers are living is that they're all crowded in together and they're right next door to the factories. This is another image of uh, worker housing. This one is in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Um, and this is, you know, an example of one of these tenements. In this case, you can see it's right next to the train line. You can also see from the number of, of windows that they're all crowded in together, not a lot of space. Um, and um, because it's right next to the train line, it's not a particularly desirable place to live, right? So it's noisy, it's, it's dangerous, it's um, dirty. And all of this is to say that um, when influenza, when Spanish flu hit uh, the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts, in 1918 it was the 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 Merrimack Valley was built up and set up in such a way as to basically roll out the red carpet for the Spanish flu when the Spanish flu hit the organization of social life was such that the Spanish flu tore through the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts in um, and just 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 beat it up so badly. And a lot of that had to do with worker housing, which is why I just showed you three photographs of worker housing. So when you've got these workers all crammed in together uh, in very tight quarters, close to one another, many people in one apartment, and then each apartment stacked on top of each other, 
and these are hastily constructed and inexpensively constructed buildings. So walls are thin and they're porous. You have a setup in which a, an infectious disease can tear right through, okay? So this speaks to two main themes that I wanna highlight. It speaks to the advantages, the real advantages in this kind of a circumstance of sprawl, of living in big ass houses with big ass yards and tall ass fences and back porches instead of front porches, right? All the things that I, under ordinary non uh, global zombie apocalypse circumstances um, argue against in this class as being bad for society um, are in this case a saving grace. That might be overstating their merits, but you get the point. And so there's a, a, a an issue that I want to draw out around the, organ the physical organization of, of social life. But I also want to point out the injustice, the, um, the environmental injustice and the environmental racism of Spanish flu and coronavirus, right? Who are the people crowded up in these tenements in 1918 in Lawrence, Massachusetts. It's not the farm girls. It's not the management. It's not the factory owners. It's all the workers. And where are the workers from? They're from, uh, they're Polish. They're Lithuanian. They're Lebanese. They're Italian, okay? And they're the ones that are hardest hit. And the same goes for us in 2020. The neighborhoods in our cities where people are the most crowded in together, where the walls are the thinnest, where the construction is the cheapest. These are minority neighborhoods. These are poor neighborhoods. The, the neighborhoods that are the farthest away from good hospitals. Neighborhoods that are the, have the le least access to good medical care. Those are the ones that are getting hit the hardest now and 102 years ago in 1918. And so, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Cuomo. You know who I'm talking about, the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, said uh, he called uh, coronavirus the great equalizer. And while it is true that a billionaire might be just as likely to, uh, you know, put his hand in his nose or something as a poor person, it is not the great equalizer, right? Communities of color and lower socioeconomic groups are getting hit much harder. Not because of the way it's transmitted, but because of the way social life is built and organized in our society because of those injustices. So what I want to do now is I want to read, uh, we're going to have story time, basically, story time. So sit on the carpet, sit on the, you know, sit on each, pick your letter. Um, that's, that's what they do in the library, it's story time. Sit on the carpet, I'm going to tell you a story. It's the story of the Spanish flu. Yay! Um, so I just have a couple of passages, not a couple, a number of passages from this chapter that you read that I want to highlight because I think they do uh, a really nice job uh, bringing some of these issues out. So this is actually the very first paragraph of the chapter that you read, and, and, and so it goes like this. Not that you can't read it yourself, but I love the sound of my voice. It's so... Silky. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Um, it goes like this. In ordinary times, the bankers, lawyers, and mill owners who lived on Tower Hill opened their doors to a quiet, broken only by the jostle of a laden milk wagon. 
Okay. So right away, she's telling us, look, bankers, lawyers, mill owners, right? The owners of the factories. These are the elite, the wealthy, the affluent. They live on Tower Hill. It's quiet where they live. The only time the quiet is broken is when the milk is being delivered, right? Jostle of a laden milk wagon, the first stirrings of a wind in the elms or the quavering notes of a sparrow. It was the height of country, the air sweet and clear. Looking east from their porches, they could survey miles of red brick textile mills that banked the canals and the sluggish Merrimack. Okay, so here what, you, what she's doing is, you know, they live, the elite, the affluent, they live separate. They're not down there in the valley near the mills where they work, where they supervise, where they oversee. They're up on the hill, right? There's a literal geographic, uh, I mean, a literal sort of hierarchy. Um, and they can look out over where all of the working people live. And the red brick textile mills, I mean, you saw the picture that I showed you from uh, Manchester with the Budweiser truck in it. I mean, those are red brick textile mills. There they are. To the west was a patchwork of small dairy holdings giving over to the blue distance. So to the east, they're looking out over um, the mills, and to the west, they're looking out over farms. Um, but for the 31 mornings of October 1918, those men, all men, adjusted gauze masks over their mouths and noses as they set out for work in the cold tinged dawn and they kept their eyes to the ground so as not to see what they couldn't help but hear the clatter of motor, cor motor cars and horse-drawn wagons over the paving stones as day and night without ceasing the ambulances ran up the hill bringing sufferers from the heart of the city and the hearses carried them away. So what happened here is this hill, uh, Tower Hill, where all the um, richest people in the city of Lawrence live, is now becoming a makeshift hospital for the thousands and thousands of deathly ill workers. And so the quiet of this re removed, uh, tranquil place ha has been burst by this disease because there are so many bodies and so many sick people that they don't have anywhere to put them. Sound familiar? So this is a photograph of that exact thing. And you can see here, this is a picture from October of 1918, which was the deadliest month of the Spanish flu. And you can see um, back here the fancy houses, right? You can see where the rich lived back here. And ordinarily, before the Spanish flu, they had all this beautiful bucolic space to look out over. But because there was nowhere in the city, the city was so crowded with factories and tenements and train cars, there was nowhere to put these people. They moved them out to Tower Hill and they created this makeshift tent city on Tower Hill to tend to the sick and the dying. And you can see them here workers in white gowns. Every one of these tents had one person, uh, one uh, sick person in it. Each tent is a sick person. Um, and the reason why this happened, the reason why, like I said, um, that Tower Hill became a makeshift hospital, a tent city hospital, in 1918 was because the Spanish flu just tore through these communities at such a fast rate and it was so infectious and it was so deadly that the medical system 
couldn't absorb. It couldn't metabolize so many sick people, so many bodies, so quickly. It wasn't set up to handle it. Well, okay, 1918. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? We've learned since then. So let me show you a photograph ta -da, of Central Park in New York City from last week. So uh, I quote directly here from a newspaper article that says, in New York City, regular life has become surreal with a temporary hospital in Central Park and refrigerated trucks acting as morgues for overwhelmed hospitals, okay? So melodrama aside, the point is this. We struggle to learn from our mistakes. We struggle to um, rationalize the investment, the long-term investment required to be able to manage a situation like this, an epidemic, uh, a, a contagion like this, because on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis, we don't see any kind of a return for that. When we are, when we have a healthcare system that is driven by profit rather than driven by acting in the public good then it doesn't make any sense, any rational sense, because it's not profitable to invest in capacity for a 100-year pandemic, right? And so here we are, literally 102 years later, with what looks like almost the same exact tent city tending to the sick and the dying. Um, in New York City right now, this week, there are sick people sitting in hallways in hospitals waiting for the next person to die so that they can get a bed, right? And again, there's this spatial division between those that are most likely to be affected and infected and those that are most likely to be able to avoid it. And it doesn't have anything to do with who is more likely to touch their face because we all touch our faces, but it has to do with uh, who has access to better health care. When, when we live in a society in which health care is a profit-driven business, then you can buy better health care than somebody else. And if you can buy better, the better, the wealthier you are, the better the health care you can acquire. So the people that are in these tents right now, I guarantee you, they're, let me, well, let me highlight them. The people that are in these tents right now, I guarantee you that they are not the people living in these buildings. Uh, hi there, I suddenly changed clothes and fast forwarded um, a month and a half, but um, I wanted to also show you uh, these photographs of um, people in masks and advertisements promoting the use of masks from 1918 in the same way that this, um, these, the juxtaposition of these photographs of the tent city in, in um, Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1918 and the tent city in Central Park in New York City in 2020 work to show us that there have been, despite uh, incredible leaps and bounds in terms of um, medical technology and in terms of scientific knowledge over the last century, um, we have in some ways not come very far in terms of our preparedness in terms of our willingness to invest in the health, in the public health infrastructure needed to treat um, adequately to absorb uh, this kind of surge in sickness. So the, the juxtaposition of those photographs of the tent cities drives that message home. 
Well, I wanted to show you these pictures of people in masks, or the one picture of a person in a mask, and, and then a photograph of um, an advertisement for masks, to drive home the point that 102 years after the quote-unquote Spanish flu, and as an aside here in brackets, I'm referring to this um, uh, infectious disease uh, over the course of this uh, presentation as the Spanish flu, that's problematic, and I probably shouldn't do that, and um, it's it's been called that quite a bit historically and, and in uh, a lot of the discourse today, um, but uh, there's no evidence that it's in any way Spanish, and, you know, that's probably uh, not the best way. It, it's no more the Spanish flu than COVID-19 is the Chinese flu. Let's put it that way. Um, so here we are, 102 years later. Uh, yeah, we have ventilators, we have uh, sophisticated um, sort of, you know, uh, uh, gene mapping technology, um, genetic modification, and and all kinds of incredible scientific um, uh, accomplishments. And yet here we are, the frontline way to treat or to deal with, it's not a treatment, but to deal with, to mitigate uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, is by using masks and by social distancing. You know where we learned how to do those things? 1918. Um, so, so our technology has uh, not advanced at all in terms of how we go about trying to protect ourselves, trying to uh, limit exposure, not just to ourselves, but to everybody else, to this contagious disease. The other thing I wanted to point out um, is, you know, people are um, pushing back against the um, requirement, the mandate that we wear masks. People are pushing back. And um, people are suggesting, many people are suggesting, and I understand where they are coming from. They are suggesting that it is their choice whether or not they wish to wear a mask. And so they're using their um, the, the politicization of the treatment of um, COVID-19 as a, uh, a way to assert their per perception of their own individual liberty. Uh, some of them have even appropriated the language of, um, of abortion rights and said, and you know, I've seen signs, my body, my choice, whether to wear a mask or not. Um, sort of, except that uh, wearing a mask does protect you, but more importantly, wearing a mask protects the people around you in case you happen to be a carrier. So anyway, there's a lot of pushback. A lot of people aren't into wearing the masks. A lot of people aren't choosing to wear the masks. And in fact, the masks bizarrely have become politicized. It's a political issue. If you see somebody walking down the street in a mask, they're probably a Democrat. If you see somebody without one, they're probably a Republican, which is kind of crazy how polarized and how politicized uh, daily life has become. But in 1918, you see this ad uh, in the newspaper um, exhorting people to wear masks and appealing to their patriotism as a way of trying to convince them to do so. Um, and so there was obviously the same kind of pushback in 1918 and along the same lines, couched, framed in this uh, language of individual liberty uh, and this sort of don't tread on me ideology. Um, and so, you know, 102 years and, and a, a long, staggering 102 years in terms of technological milestones. And here we are in virtually uh, the same exact set of circumstances dealing with a, um, a contagion uh, through what is essentially 
a, a hundred year old technology, gauze masks and staying inside. So here's another quotation from the reading. At home, in their tenements, the mill workers breathed in the smells of rubbish and night soil that drifted up from the alleyways where they lived was low lying. So much, so such smells together with smoke and ash hung in the air. Their heat was sparse. They were crowded into their rooms. The flu cut right through, spreading ahead of its own rumors, passing on a handshake and on the wind and with the lightest kiss. No spitting, no sharing food, keep your hands clean, avoid crowds, walk everywhere, sleep with your windows open. And I wanted to share that particular paragraph because it really sounds like you could just copy and paste that into 2020 and it would be the same thing that we're being told. No touching, social distancing, um, avoid crowds. I mean, you know, it's almost word for word. And I, I just find that uncanny. I mean, it's, it's interesting in, a, in an intellectual way, but it's also tragic that um, we have, over the course of a century, in the country that houses the biggest economy in the world, have made so little progress in terms of our ability to manage th these kinds of shocks to our healthcare system. Another quotation for you. One doctor could see hundreds of cases a day and in his haste to complete his records, he sometimes left out the ages of the victims and often the names. They come down now in the influenza journal, distinguished only by their address or their nationality. Four cases, 384 Common Street downstairs, or mother and child, baby Rosano, father and son, a Syrian fellow, Polish man. And so I include this just to just to kind of give you a sense of, again, what I was talking about with the sort of ethnic and national diversity of this particular place because of the nature of the work um, and the way in which uh, mill management was recruiting from um, the poorest parts of Eastern uh, and Southern Europe to do these jobs. And here she's describing um, in the tent hospitals, the sick, the, the, the dying people and their um, uh, sort of drifting in and out of consciousness and the confusion that arises from that. And so they, so she says, she writes, the nun's habits swished. What country was this? A cough, a groan, the stricken tossed in their fevers, their muscles ached. One moment they had the sweats, the next chills. In 45 different languages and dialects, they called for water and warmth. And another quotation. And I think this is either the last or the second to last one. So here she writes, in the central city, those who were spared became captive to a strange altered music. All the sounds of their streets, voices and songs, teams hauling loads over paving stones, elm whips cracking the air and animals, bottles nudging one another in the back of a truck, the deliberate tread of the ice man on their stairs, all these were no longer heard. And I like that sentence because I think it's something that we can all identify with. How many of us have um, walked uh, somewhere where we would expect under ordinary circumstances there to be a lot of people and it's empty? How many of us have seen the photographs of the streets of New York City right now of the streets of, uh, or the shopping malls in New York City. For example, I've walked um, 
onto ISU's campus since this happened. And I would expect to see on a beautiful spring day, 68 degrees, I'd expect to see all of you on the quad, hammocks, frisbees, um, 2020, so maybe some weed. And um, there's no one there. It's empty. I walk to Uptown. I would expect to see families out walking around on the circle. It's empty, right? And as, as so as Jane Brox writes it here, it's a strange altered music, right? It's this 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 sort of like um, this silence that uh, that um, is uh, is disconcerting. Um, okay, so the next sentence, she says, uh, we're no longer heard or weren't heard as usual. Survivors strained at the absence as if they were listening for flowing water after a cold snap. Water now trapped and nearly silenced by clear ice. Schools and movie houses had been ordered closed and bolted shut. Well, again, 102 years later and here we are. Schools have been ordered closed, movie houses closed restaurants and bars, cafes closed, libraries closed, gyms closed. So um, as, as different as our lives are, as, as quaint and ancient as the idea of a ice man, right? Like a person that goes door to door delivering ice or a milk truck, as ancient as those things sound to us in our world of ice makers and um, and uh, you know pasteurized, homogenized gallons of skim milk, um, I mean there are things that are exactly the same, right? That anxiety, that uncertainty about of parents and children when schools close for the first time and as far back as we can remember. Well, it wasn't the first time. It happened in 1918 too. Last quote. The flow of supply wagons slowed as well. There was no commerce in bolts of velvet, silk, silk puffs, worsted suits, or pianos. Um, you know, this is also, I mean, this, this also feels very familiar, right? Um, Today, we don't talk about supply wagons. We talk about supply chains. Google coronavirus and supply chains and you will get thousands of hits, right? Um, there is still no toilet paper in the stores. Um, so commerce crawled to a stop in 1918. We were also in the middle of World War I in 1918. And shortly thereafter, we hit the Great Depression. And um, there was, although it was by no means the only factor in bringing about the Great Depression, the Spanish flu pandemic the numbers of people that died and the adverse impacts on the economy from everything being closed did factor into bringing about the Great Depression. Uh, so the flow of supply wagons slowed as well. There was no commerce in bolts of velvet silk puffs. I don't know what a silk puff is, do you? I don't know. Sounds funny. Worsted suits, I know what that is. Worsted is a, uh, it's a type of wool. Worsted suits or pianos. Bakers who used to shape 100 granary loaves a day, split and seeded and washed with a glaze of milk, took to preparing 50 or 60 unadorned loaves. In the corner groceries, scab on the early apple crop spread, grapes softened and soured and pears turned overripe in their crates. And this is interesting, too, because it's she's describing the sort of paradox where on the one hand, bakers, instead of 100 loaves, 
that are all, you know, dolled up with uh, seeds and washed in milk and all this fancy stuff. Now they're making 50 loaves that don't have anything, right? So there's less bread. The bread is less um, uh, elegant. It's of lower quality and less adorned. And so there is want. There is scarcity. There is hunger associated with this shock to our economy and to our medical system and to our lives, our social lives. But not only is there want and scarcity, there's also abundance. Uh, there's The pears are, are rotting, the grapes are rotting because there is nobody to eat them, right? Everybody is either dead or shut in. Um, supply chains are interrupted, so you might have hungry people over here and you might have an abundance of fruit over here and you can't connect those two things to one another any longer. Um, and so it's, it's, there's a, a paradox there of both scarcity and abundance at the very same time, which I thought was, was good. So um, this is the, uh, the presentation for today. And so let me go back and recap um, the what I think are the key messages, although again, as I started by saying, this is an entangled, multifaceted thing here, and so there's a lot to get out of it, and um, uh, whatever you get out of it is good, but what I was trying to convey, what I was, the main things that I was hoping to convey were, one, the physical setup of our social life matters a tremendous amount for public health. How we live, with whom we live, the nature of the buildings, the distance from our homes to our jobs, the character of our jobs, our relationships with our managers, our relationships with our co-workers, all of these mundane aspects of the sort of physical setup of our quotidian social worlds have profound implications for, among every other thing, for public health. And it's only in a moment like 2020, like coronavirus, when those connections are unveiled and on display in all of their naked glory for us to behold. So if so the sprawl, if you can get it, if you can get it, man, then you're in good shape. I mean, relative to other people. If you've got a big old house where everybody has their own room and everybody has their own device and you got uh, wireless router boosters on every floor and a big old backyard, then you're living the dream uh, relative to other people who are cooped up with families of six in two and three bedroom apartments. And so while sprawl, and I will continue to argue that sprawl is bad under ordinary circumstances for the environment, for the macroeconomy, for our social lives, for um, racial justice, social justice, class justice. Um, if you can get it in these times of uncertainty, then um, you, can, you can begin to see why the suburbs are so appealing to so many of us. That's one point. The other point, you know, tied into that is um, that this is a, this is not a natural disaster. This is the, you know, COVID-19, this global pandemic, these tens of thousands of people who are dead now, and hundreds of thousands of people who will die. You know how many people died in, uh, in 1918 in the, the Spanish flu? 500 million people around the world. And that was 1918. There were a lot fewer people 
in the world in 1918. In the United States, a million people in 1918 died from Spanish flu. Well, actually just shy of a million, but if you round up, it's very close to a million. This is, this is um, we are going to see pain from this if we haven't already. We will see pain all around us. Um, and it's a pain that is going to have ripple effects in the economy for a long time to come. But it's not, this is not a natural disaster. This is a disaster that is born of inequality. Okay. Uh, it's a disaster, it's, it's, it's a disaster that was created by global economic inequality. How? Well, take for example the very fact that this virus um, touched down in human lungs for the first time, we think, in a, an open air meat market in uh, Wuhan, China. And, you know, look for look at pictures on Google Images of uh, what they call wet markets in China. Um, read about the kinds of meats, the bush meat, it's called, that gets um, butchered and sold at these wet markets, right? Um, I mean, basically anything with flesh, they will butcher it and they will sell it to you because people need protein. And... Um, in a world in which some of us live in luxury and eat fancy, um, you know, grass-fed, Japanese butchered, Argentinian grown protein, right? Others of us are in a dirty, dank, and incredibly densely populated open air wet market in China eating whatever flesh we can afford. Um, that's inequality, right? That's economic inequality on the global level. And it's the intersection. It's the, it's the place where the biophysical world, right? This, this virus that's inside a bat or inside a rat or whatever it is, the biophysical world, ecosystems independent of human activity, and the uh, the the anthropogenic uh, constructed built world that we live in, and all of its socioeconomic inequality, those two things come together, and that virus jumps from a bat into a person, and then takes off around the world. So it's so this is a this is a, a case and a moment in which global um, economic inequality is unveiled. It's a case and it's a moment in which the relationship between nature and human society and the intertwinement, the entanglement of those two things is unveiled. Um, and it's a moment in which, uh, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I guess that's all I have to say. Um, those are my my uh, lessons for you today. Um, I hope I have satisfactorily conveyed this. Um, I am eager to have a conversation with you in the comments section down there. Uh, also, by the way, this will be the last video of the semester. So you may see me on a live stream, but you will not see another one of these videos. So thank you um for doing this thank you for being here thank you for finding ways to forge onward uh in this um time of um great uncertainty okay bye